Welcome to Intuition, Your Success Compass. First time I'm saying that. Thank you for being here and sticking with me as we expand and learn more and get into the nitty gritty of what it looks like to live your most successful life. Again, not up to me what your success is. Not up to me what success feels like or how you define it. It would be great if you looked at your own definition of it and started to feel into it. And as a result of this exploration that I've been doing around the word success and realizing this is actually my specialty of helping people to align with their most successful message, life, joy, playfulness, expression, creativity, the list goes on and on and on. I'm here to help you arrive in that life and occasionally give you a little encouraging boot in the butt to get going and to live the life, not just dream about the life. This episode, I have a wonderful product that has actually brought success to my life. It's a wonderful supplement called Magic Mind. And stay tuned because you're going to want to know about this. I have had an importing of ideas of subjects to cover. And I'm excited about that because I feel like even though I'm sitting here talking to myself, I always feel like you're in the room with me. And I always feel like we're having some kind of dialogue that asks me to reach into what I've learned, what I know about this human experience, and what I've garnered as skills in working with so many amazing people to bring this to you. And I feel like the subject matter is going to go deeper. And I'm excited about that. Because how are we going to live our most successful lives and be the most in joy we can be if we're not uncovering what might be under the surface and what may no longer be serving us? And I am someone who loves to purge things. I like to give things away. I like to be complete with stuff. I like to let something go to its next life if it's no longer serving me, be it furniture, books, well, homes. We're, we're giving, not giving away home. We're, we cannot give away the home. We still have to pay for the new home. But the space, when it's complete, you move on to the next one, right? So... I am someone who likes to also delve into what is that feeling? Do I still feel? I don't know if I feel that. I ask myself these questions all the time. And it, I'm not asking these questions. I find I get really stagnant and I get bored and then I get cranky because one, as a reflection of one of my family members said to me not too long ago, you know what, Vicky, just because you want to look at the deeper subjects doesn't mean everybody does. And I so appreciate her honesty because I get that. But this is my podcast and I want to delve into the deeper meaning stuff. And oftentimes it, these examples come to me as a result of conversations with others, right? And this topic today about are we conflicted or are we not? Are we in conflict or are we not? I just love the play of words. And it came to me because somebody reflected to me that I am definitely a no BS person. And I set an example for those who are more vulnerable or who are afraid of conflict. And when I received that message, I thought about it for a moment because it had some familiarity to me. And then I also felt like, it felt very new to me. And when that happens, I love staying in that moment because I know that something has shifted and I may not have acknowledged it yet and I want to acknowledge it. And even if I'm having this person, this talk in person, I will say, hang on a minute, I need to feel that one out. What was happening is I have definitely been called a no BS person before. That's not new. And yet it's always been in a derogatory sense that I have no feelings or that I'm cold or unemotional or not understanding where the other person is coming from. And I used to be really hurt by that. And it used to be one of my triggers because I would get defensive. 
And then I realized that, well, if I don't have triggers, people cannot trigger me. So let me go see how many triggers I can find. And this was one of them. I am a no BS person in the context of, no, I don't like bullshit. I want straight up conversations. If you don't like me, tell me. I mean, it might not hurt my feelings, truthfully, because I have moved past that trigger affect, at least regarding that. So there's still some in there that I'm working on because eh, I'm physical, I'm human. And that's a beautiful thing. When I received this message of being a no BS person, I read it very matter of fact, which is what I always recommend you do reading messages of any type, whether it's a post on social media, a text, an email, read it as if you are that computer voice without inflection. Because the minute we put inflection into anything, we are bringing our judgment and we are bringing our hurts and our boo-boos. But it was fascinating for me to read this and go, I am a no BS person because I don't understand why we're BSing each other. Just speak to what you speak. If somebody is trying to sell me something and they're giving me all this flowery talk, oh, I am out. I've already made up my mind that we are not going to do work together. If somebody approaches me to do a collaboration and they're doing that fawning thing, well, respectfully, I say, okay, just tell me what you're looking for and we'll see if this will work. So in that regard, yeah, I am a no BS person. The, the sentence that came after, you said a good example for us more vulnerable types. And when I read that, I felt like, wait a minute, having a no BS dance as in, I want truth, I want transparency, I want respectful conversation. Let me tell you, asking for those things are some of the most vulnerable steps I have ever taken. In saying to someone, I hear what you're saying, what you're saying is not a truth to me, I am open to discussing it further, but I'm not going to be gaslit, I'm not going to be BS to myself. And I'm not going to believe what you're telling me or who you're telling me I am because I spent too many decades doing that. So when I read that, I felt a certain responsibility to those of us who have decided that they are no longer going to be afraid of conversation or afraid of interaction because we have strapped our knobby my knees are far from knobby, but are shaking knees together and support them to be able to say some of the suggestions I'm going to give you later in the podcast and how to approach this. So if you meet someone who is self-assured, who is holding their energy of themselves and within themselves in a very secure way, and you know the difference between somebody who is posturing or is being a braggadocious or that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about meeting that person who is of strength within themselves because they know themselves so well that whatever you say to them, they're going to take into consideration and then they're going to weigh it against how they know themselves. Does it fit? Is there room for improvement? That type of person, right? Which is often how the label of a no BS or they take no crap. And it's not, we, it's defensive mechanism. It's not at all. It's a position of, I have spent so much time with myself that I know myself so well that no, I am not who you say I am. And if there's something you can reflect to me that I need to grow on, I will listen. So the other statement was that I set a good example, which I am appreciative for, but I don't want those who are standing in their own personal power to be seen as uh, tough or no vulnerability. And yes, I do think that uh, the more we explore emotions, the more empowered we are. And I also feel like there can be a lean towards victimhood in all of this. This is where I say I'm not a therapist and I'm not here to treat anyone. I'm not here to make blanket statements. I'm going from my experience and my experience is that as humans, we can often get in our story and our labels of I'm too sensitive to be with people 
I'm afraid of conflict. I'm not that person. That may be true that you're not that person. Some people just do not want to do this. It's fine. But the idea of positioning someone who is knowing their own voice as being less vulnerable is a slippery slope too, because it pits us against each other. And I just don't think that we should measure vulnerability or sensitivity. When I receive this, I reflected to the person that I I am no BS. That's absolutely true. But no BS isn't a conflict position. It's about self-value and believing that when we inhabit ourselves fully, conflict isn't necessary. Boundaries may be, and they can be held respectfully for all parties. Yes, that may mean an end to a relationship, and that has to be okay too. It may surprise some people who hear me and and interact with me and everything to find out that I've actually never conflicted with anyone. And by that, I mean have a fight, with the exception of my late husband. Because anybody who tells me they've been in a relationship and doesn't fight, (laughs) in 27 years, you're going to have a fight. And, And we did. Not often, but we did. So other than that, I have never stood in argument with someone. And I really believe that a lot of this is my personality. But it's also because as a child, I was hit so much and I was beat so much that there was a fear in there that I had to work through at certain times of my life. Was it avoidant? And we're going to talk about that. Yes, it was. Because I wasn't sure that there wasn't a beating coming for me if I said something. And the beating wouldn't necessarily be physical. It could be emotional or verbal or any of that. But as Vicky herself, I can say I've never been in a fight with someone. We're going to have to take siblings when I was four or five years old out of this because I honestly don't remember. And I'm sure I did. But as a conscious adult, nope, nope. And I have had the perfect opportunities to do so. But I have always felt that raising our voice and raising an anger was not going to get us anywhere. And actually, one of my kids told me one time that when I did yell for them to do something, it never bothered them. But when I got quiet and I stated what I want, I stated what I expected, and then I asked, did they understand me, that that used to scare them just a little bit because they were more comfortable with the yelling. I think this is true of a lot of people. Like sometimes they're more comfortable with yelling and hollering and all that where nothing gets done. And I just thought, I'm not doing that. I grew up with that. I'm not doing it. My choice is to state what I feel, what I know. Listen, if they have something to say, if they want to say something, you can take into consideration their point and leave if it's not mutually respectful. And I've actually ended relationships where I have said to the person, we are not of the same understanding or trajectory or desire in this relationship. And I want to still care about you. And I'm going to back up before we get into a place where we don't care about each other, because that would be sad to me. I've had the experience where people think I'm faking it when I see them after we've had a conflict or, you know, a a disagreement or anything like that. And when I genuinely say, hey, how you doing? I had people stand there like almost paralyzed that something's coming. And I'm like, honest to goodness, I have never done that. I'm never going to do it. I mean, have I stood up for children? Yes. But in the case of our own interactions, no, not going to happen. Because if we can't discuss it at this level, I don't want to discuss it. We're going to take a break. We're going to calm down. We'll come back together if we can. And that, to me, has actually been the height of vulnerability for me because it means that I have to be strong enough within myself that whomever I'm having this conversation with, I may never have a conversation with again. And I have to be okay with that. It's been heart-wrenching and at times emotionally debilitating. But I always come back to I will respect a soul's decision not to be anywhere near me because <laughs> I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but I will respect my soul more by not aligning with those 
where I'm not accepted or I'm mislabeled. Where does this all come from? It, it comes from recognizing that it's not easy and yet it's worth it. I want to make sure that we can feel empowered and we can feel belief in ourselves and that it doesn't get translated as the bitchy woman or the cranky man or the person who is resentful of this or that. Blah, blah, blah. Stop with the labels. I want to make sure that vulnerability is available to everyone and not categorized. And I'm so grateful for this because this comment that she made, because it helped me figure out within myself if I was okay with how somebody labeled me. I am. But I happen to love this person. So that's why the contact of the reflection back of, actually, I'm not. I am an no BS person, but this isn't a conflict. And then her second statement of afraid of conflict rang up within me because if we're going to have our most successful year and you're with me on that, right? 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 I'm applying that even to my garden because it didn't go so great last year. So this year I have 12 above bed grounds and you better believe I'm going to see if I can feed the whole neighborhood. I want a successful garden too. If we're going to have the most successful year, the most abundant, then we have to look at statements like afraid of conflict because rarely things are in conflict. I mean, wars, yes. Someone who is creating a disturbance in home or public, conflict, perhaps. But rarely are things in conflict. And it's been elevated to this place of everything is conflict. And it's like, it's not really, actually. Everything is an opportunity for understanding and for communication. But if you label yourself as afraid of conflict, then you're just going to create more fear of having any kind of resolution. So what I did was I thought about this for a while, and then I went to kind of this assessment thing I have that I use for myself and with others of, okay, where is there conflict? Because you can be in conflict with yourself. And most of us are in conflict with ourselves more than we will be in other people or with other people because we spend so much stinking time with ourselves, right? There are different ways that everyone, that anyone rather, might handle conflict. And when I'm talking about conflict, I'm talking about a difference of opinion or difference of perspective. It's not a disagreement. It's not taking sides. It's where you have one idea and the person or the company may have another idea and there is something that needs to be worked out. Very rarely are we in disagreement or war. We're more in miscommunication and confusion. What I'm going to lay out, though, are the ways that people typically handle conflict. And under the definition of perhaps afraid to conflict, conflict? <laughs> yeah. Conflict, <laughs> wrong influence there. Afraid to conflict with another. Because I'd like to help if that's a label you've been using. I'd like to take the pressure off of that and say, are you really? Or are you dealing with some of these other things? Okay, that's what we're going to do. As somebody who used to avoid conversations because of that fear of being the, I get this stuff and I've done every level of it. And I'm here to tell you on the other side of it, very rarely is there a conflict in life. We're just making it too big in our heads. Okay. The first step is usually avoidant, right? And with the caveat of if there's a safety issue here, of course you get out of the situation. You don't try to converse. You just get yourself to safety and you get help. But most people will handle conflict by avoiding it, just straight up ignoring it, not dealing with it, pushing it down and changing the subject, pretending it doesn't even exist. What conflict? What are you talking about? That didn't happen. Meanwhile, the rest of us are like, it happened right in front of our face. Yes, some of this can be as a result of post-trauma or current trauma if you're in a domestic 
dispute. Please hear this with all of that caveat, all those caveats. All right. I'm not suggesting that everybody just show up and no longer listen to their inner voice if they're nervous or fearful or something. Please don't take this to that extreme either. If you're avoidant of conflict, you may ignore it. You may change the subject, divert the attention away, come up with a different scenario, completely change what we were talking about. My my former mother-in-law used to do that. If I said to her, if I continued a conversation of what we were having and she didn't want to talk about it, she would talk about the most random thing. And I know it was her narcissistic personality that was just trying to unground me, but it often didn't work. But I would still choose to walk away. Someone might change the subject and you're left spinning like, what just happened? Did I miss? Did I black out? Did something happen where I wasn't paying attention? Because they don't want to face it, right? They don't want to talk about whatever the subject is. I had an experience with this. It was a very painful subject that conversation with somebody that I thought was dear to me. And when I brought it up, she proceeded to tell me all the things I had done wrong. And I was like, what? I did not see you as this type of person. And it's because I did that work that I could see it so clearly. And I still left the conversation respectfully and said, I wished her well, because I really do. And I have not talked to her in three years. That bothers me. I'll be truthful, but I am not willing to be in a conversation where I get to be blamed for the experiences I went through as a child, not as an adult. I'll take responsibility for that. Sometimes people just shut down. And yes, this is a trauma response, but sometimes they'll just shut down and sometimes they'll shut down the conversation. Recognizing that, oh, they're trying to avoid any conflict here. You can actually help with that by saying, trying to conflict here or cause any confrontation. I I, I want to understand. If you're someone who's been saying you're afraid of conflict, can you shift that to, I've previously been afraid and now I'm curious that was there really this much conflict in my life to begin with? Because then as humans, we bring drama. Things get bigger than they need to be. And that's a whole other podcast for why we bring the drama. But there is often a buildup when it's just not there in the first place. So one of the ways that you can do that, handle this or shift it and go into curiosity. If you are still practicing a fear of conflict is you can deal with it. Yep. It is that easy. Knees knocking, heart palpitating, short of breath, deal with it. Because if you push it down, whatever it is, the conflict in your mind, I promise you will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And What you resist persists. So if you're pushing against it, it's going to get larger. It's going to get bigger. It will create anxiety or even anger within yourself because anger often has, you know, other emotions underneath, right? And insecurity, guilt, and unworthiness is always underneath anger unless an egregious action has been created against you and then the anger is very valid. It may not be related to insecurity, guilt, or unworthiness. But the more you avoid it, it may feel good at the time. Like, sure, I just dodged that one. I got out of there. I, I, that was who. But it's just going to have to happen. It's going to still eat at you on some level. And then that can lead to living in fear. It can lead to feeling like you have no power. And in this case, you would be disempowering yourself. And let's not do that anymore, okay? It builds up in the corners, just like if you don't take care of papers or magazines or the laundry on that chair, it doesn't magically disappear. It stays there and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. So for your emotional health, dealing with any of this like just having the conversation, I find most people are really reasonable. They don't want the conflict there. They don't want the misunderstanding, which is most of this stuff. And sometimes it may feel good at the time, 
to not place a boundary. So I said I was going to tell you about Magic Mind. You know I love bringing products to you that have significantly helped my life. And this is magic and it's perfect marketing for the name. I became aware of it through social media and then they reached out to me because they listen to the podcast. So how cool is that? They must be amazing people, right? I tried this. I've been using it and I have noticed a big difference. Where? Well, my focus, my productivity, my my ability to remain calm when life is spinning out. I know you know this feeling where there's just so much to pay attention to and brain is like tilt, tilt, tilt. So Magic Mind has all the ingredients that I love, the matcha, honey, and the nootropics. And it's just a great product. So I agreed to work with them to get this to you. So I, I'm just going to suggest you head on over there and give it a try. There's increased percentages off. Now it was 45. It's now increased. You can go to magicmind.co slash intuition. And your code is going to be intuition to get the discount. You want to do that. And something that I'm going to keep talking about because I really believe in it and I really know the benefit of my own focus. And I know it has helped to turn down the adrenal response of fear that may come up with change because change is going to happen. I would recommend the subscription because once you try it, you really are going to be like, this is all natural. I can feel this good. And then it's going to help you manage the rest of your life in a way that feels supportive and that feels aligned. And I feel like that's what's most important to me is I want to feel aligned. And I know those of you listening to this particular podcast are going to feel the same. So check out the link in the show notes, head on over there and see if it will work for you. Who doesn't want a little bit more productivity, focus, being able to be present? It's a gift. It really is magic. <laughs> Check it out. Can you tell I'm excited? Check it out. I had a client one time who was paying for their adult child to come in. And I'm okay with that for a few sessions. Sure, you want to give somebody a couple sessions. I'm okay with that. But I firmly know and believe that you need to invest in your own growth. So if someone isn't paying for sessions, they're not going to do the work. They're not going to invest in anything. And I had a client who was paying for her adult child to come in. And I was working with an adult. I wasn't working with a child. This woman would call me and want a feedback after every session. And I said, no, you don't get that. I'm working with an adult here. You may see them as your child they're an adult. She would call each time and she said, I'm owed this. And I said, you aren't actually owed this. Even if I was HIPAA compliant, you wouldn't be owed this. And I consider myself to have to be HIPAA compliant, even though no one is making me be HIPAA compliant. And she didn't like that. So I fired her. I fired her as the pay source. And I worked with her adult child for two months in creating their stability and in creating their belief in themselves to, you guessed it, get out from underneath control of the mother and to decide what it is that they'd like to do. But I could have avoided that conversation. I could have avoided her phone calls, but it does no good. And it sometimes only empowers the person who thinks that they can keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And it's just going to build up. And I didn't want it to carry over to how I felt about the adult child and totally, totally upfront with them to let them know this is what I'm going to do. They were absolutely blown away because evidently no one <laughs> had dared to take on the parent. But if you're not showing up for those conversations and willing to know who you are and speak to who you are, you're missing an opportunity for growth. And it, you may want to look at why are you avoiding it? Like in the conversation with my client, I asked them, why do you know why you feel like you're not a card carrying adult? And we talked about that. We did the work around it. And they found an internship across the country to go practice being an adult. And 
not about dividing relationships. It's about each person standing individually in their own power. And hopefully, you know, mom got to live her own life and realized that she had fun things to do too. Why are you avoiding? Do you lack the self-surety to be able to have the conversation with someone? Is there something within this that you have to admit that you've participated in? So if you've placated another's behavior, didn't cut somebody off from spending on your card, or didn't talk to that supervisor who was being derogatory, you didn't file a report, you didn't call the medical establishment to set up a payment plan and then it went to collections. Like, where's your responsibility in this? And is that what you're avoiding? Because sometimes people avoid feeling empowered. It can feel like, oh, if I feel empowered, I got to hold on to it forever. I got to maintain that feeling. No, 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 it's not possible. You can feel empowered for that moment, maybe ride it for a little while. And then you can realize, I do not know how to do this. I was totally confused about how to put the elliptical together this weekend. And granted, step back, think, pause, breathe, and you go, oh, that's where it goes. But it, it's not like I'm successful in everything. I can do this. No, that would life would be boring. And we wouldn't get to practice over and over again feeling good about ourselves. Take a little inventory. Are you avoiding conversations with someone? Are you afraid that they're going to leave your life? Well, then look at that fear. Deal with that feel, fear rather, and be ready for it should they say that. But then also commit to yourself that you are going to go into it with an open mind and absolutely leave room for them to show who they are and, and how they are. In doing that, it often energetically switches the situation. I mean, have you ever been that voice of reason in a, like a public situation, right? Something, the line's not moving, something's going on, and somebody's being disruptive, and that actually doesn't help the line move, but if you stay in your calm, things eventually happen. Or if you're the voice of reason, you can de-escalate things. Well, that's because there's a knowing there of who you are, what you're capable of, and yet pushing yourself a little bit into a place that feels a little uncomfortable. And that's just part of being human. So know what your beliefs are. If this is the discussion that you have to have with a supervisor or a boss or your mechanic or something of that nature, know your facts going in. That will help you. And then recognize that we are simply trying to come to a solution here or, or a mutually beneficial outcome. Even if this makes you feel like, no, 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 not doing that, Vic. I'm going to stay afraid of conflict. Well, I would suggest then that for your own inner peace, that maybe you work with a therapist or a coach or somebody that can help you at least be in neutral, I guess. Outside of that, what you can do is practice communicating in less stressful situations because each time you do that, it will build your sense of self, your confidence, your surety that when something comes up and you need to have a discussion and you will do it then from a place of calm because you've already practiced before, right? You have already done this and it takes, it does take some courage, but think about the time and energy that you spend ruminating over what that other person must be thinking or what they're going to do. We don't know until we get there like to practice being obtuse. I don't know how someone's going to handle a situation until I get there. And that takes a lot of practice because intuitively, a lot of the times I do know. But if it's Vicky interacting with someone, I am not looking at that because I want to show up in my most collected self. And if I'm tapping into the other person's energy, I can't do that. One of the questions I ask is, what don't I know yet? 
in in this discussion, what don't I know yet? I use this a lot with people that I am contracting with. So people I've hired to do some work for me. If something doesn't go the way I thought it was going to go, the way that we talked about it going, I come from the perspective of what don't I know yet? Maybe the software crashed on them. Maybe they had a power outage. Maybe they didn't understand what we said, even though I thought they understood what we said. So I go in with, what don't I know yet? Do you have information for me that I am not aware of? And can you share that with me? Often that has also de-escalated. And it also avoids excuses on the other person's part. Like if they want to give you excuses to why they're always late or things like that. If you hold an energy of self-surety and then you say to them, well, what don't I know yet? Well, maybe you don't know that their only vehicle broke down last night and they took four buses and an Uber to get to you. And that's why they were late. Wouldn't that make you more open (laughs) to someone's situation rather than being all conflicted in how this is going to go? So separate out the problem from the person. It's not the person unless they have egregious behavior, and then, well, you might want a third party there. But oftentimes, it's just the situation that's not okay for each of you. If you recognize that, oh, it's not the person, it's this situation that's not ideal, then you can distinguish the difference, and you'll have a much calmer energy field in having a conversation, whether this is over the phone or over computer or in person, if you recognize, and you can even then maybe articulate that we seem to have a miscommunication or there's an issue with this, can you help me understand it? Which is going back to the previous, what don't I know yet? And what that will do is bring clarity and it will help you to communicate clearly. And often we feel nervous when we don't know how we're going to communicate. Well, if you're someone who legitimately gets nervous and tongue-tied, write that stuff down. Don't be afraid to have a cue card and use it as your focal point because maybe you do to get distracted and maybe you do get nervous because until you practice this a little bit, you will be nervous. But if you strive to understand the other person's perspective, it will take energy out of the situation too. It will take that what you're calling conflict out because you're just trying to understand the other person's perspective. I recently released someone who was doing work for me because there was a difference of perspective. And honestly, it just made it more efficient. I have another podcast on that coming up for my business. And the, the, their response to my completing the contract at the end of the contracted time was to try to guess why I was not renewing when I had stated extremely clearly in the email why I was not renewing. And they still listed all the things that they quote unquote did wrong. But that wasn't even on my mind because I didn't think the things that happened were wrong. They were just a miscommunication or an oops, one time an oops. We're human. We're not going to get everything right. Their attempt to tell me why I was canceling was actually one of the reasons that I didn't want to renew as I was tired of being told what I knew was wrong. (laughs) And it is my business. So I had to then understand where they were coming from. And I sent an email very very clearly stating this has nothing to do with those couple of times that we had boo-boos. Wasn't even on my radar. And I would suggest you not going into conversations with stuff like this because you don't need to create conflict where there is none. There absolutely was none. I appreciated their position because, yeah, it's a contract that's not renewing. And I then felt like I'll take responsibility for my words, my actions. And in that stating that, There was one thing that I hadn't gotten to them yet. I finished it within 15 minutes and got it right off to them because that was a responsibility. And I did appreciate where they were coming from. Once again, standing in my own knowledge, I had done all the research, the data. I had 
challenge the system that would have to be in place without them doing it. And I felt fairly confident that this is the best course of action for me. So while I could appreciate their position, I was still able to stand in my own clarity of, no, I actually know what I'm talking about here. So if you're with someone and you really want to understand their position, oftentimes, I'm sure you've heard the expression bird's eye view, you come up above the situation. And I like looking at it that way. Come up above, raise your vibration, raise your frequency, come up above the situation, get your ego out of it. I love the little bugger, but it doesn't need to be in it in this situation. So you look at from outside the situation. Because maybe you think you know best, like the former contracted uh, company. He thought he knew best for my business. And you just don't. You don't. Because I've only shared with you what I share. And I have all the data on this side. Coming up to the bird's eye view and understanding that you may not have all the information, but if you remove yourself from knowing best for others, And to my case of the parent of the adult being, I can't call them a child because they're no longer a child. I know they're still our children, but they're no longer a child. And we ought to be raising adults in this world and not these entitled that are out there on some planets here. So if you're doing a bird's eye view and you're looking at it from above the situation, if you were a parent who was still supporting or placating or allowing poor behavior... If you come up above the situation and you recognize, whoa, I actually signed on as the parent, I need to very much hold the parent role here in no thank you. That is not behavior that's acceptable. And if you are supporting them, maybe you create a transition plan because you're not serving anyone by paying for everything, making it okay for everyone, thinking you're making it okay because they, everybody deserves to stand in their own belief in themselves. And sometimes that means that we step away from them in order for them to do it. If you're willing to do that, and then you address issues or problems or miscommunications very early on, most of the definition of conflict will never happen unless you're bringing the drama. (laughs) And then you just want to be honest. Is it me? (laughs) I love that, that me. (laughs) Is it me? Do you think it's me? I don't think it's me. It's me, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of the times it is us because we get so wrapped up in the story in our stinking head that we don't even realize (laughs) that we're the ones bringing the conflict. So don't bring it and it won't be there. So address issues early before they build, before you stuff them, and before you begin to resent that the other person isn't a mind reader. And then if you still have difference, that's okay. You know what, if if there's still an issue there, if it's in your partnership, perhaps you go to therapy together. If it's at work, maybe you look for another job because we're not going to change people. People have to decide to change for themselves. And that includes you. But if you want to have your most successful year yet and you want to feel this joy that is of your life and deserve it of you and you deserve it of it, then paying attention to what's going on right in front of you And being willing to have those conversations is vitally important. And then maybe you'll look like someone who, to someone else, may have the reputation of no BS when it's your beautifully simplistic approach to life. Shifting from bullshit, no bullshit, to beautifully simplistic. We have the conversations. We just have the conversation. And I hope for you that if there's someone in your life who is in this mode of communication, that this maybe helped you to be able to understand where they're coming from and sometimes even strategically move the conversation forward by saying, I'd like to have another conversation about that. Or I don't know that we completely understood each other. Could we have a conversation at this time about the subject? The more clear we are, the less ambiguity, the more peace that is going to exist in our world. And like I've often said, the more you like you, the more you're going to send that energy out and the kinder this world is going to be. So 
beautifully simplistic. Okay. See you in the next episode. Wow. Thank you for listening to this episode of Intuition, Your Success Compass. If you still want some more Vicky and some more intuitive development skills, you can head over to VickiBaird.com. That's V-I-C-K-I-B-A-I-R-D.com and check out all the courses that are there, the app that's available for you to load directly on your phone. And for the Wisdom Wednesday group that meets once a month, where you can meet like-minded people, have instruction in your intuition development, as well as coaching strategies for navigating this amazing life that you are in. Thank you again for all you do and who you are. And I will see you over on the website and I will see you in the next episode.